A lot of us have heard about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and it's an interesting concept. However, it's a very tricky idea to actually wrap your head around. So in this video, I'm going to explain exactly what the principle is and give you a way of thinking about it that will hopefully make things a lot clearer. And don't worry, you don't need to know any advanced level maths or physics to understand this video, just some high school stuff. Hey, what's up you lot? My name's Path, beard level's critical at this point, and I make fun physics videos, though I don't have to try too hard because physics is already fun. Now, before I go into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, I just quickly wanted to mention, if you enjoyed this video, then please leave a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit that bell button if you want to be notified every time I upload. Finally, before we get into the video, if you want to learn a little bit more about quantum mechanics, then check out this video I made about the Schrodinger equation. So, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. First of all, what even is it? Well, the uncertainty principle is a concept within the framework of quantum mechanics, which, by the way, deals with very, very small objects. Now, the principle itself says something really baffling. It tells us that there is a fundamental and universal limit to how much we can know about pairs of quantities known as conjugate variables. Now, for our purposes in this video, conjugate basically means related to each other or linked together in a specific way. And variables are quantities that vary or change. Now, most commonly the uncertainty principle is described using the quantities of position and momentum. Momentum, by the way, is directly related to a particle's speed. It's not exactly the same thing. There is a difference between speed and momentum. But for this video, we'll kind of use the two terms interchangeably because they're very closely related to each other. With these quantities, we're told that the more we know about one, the less we can know about the other. More specifically then, the uncertainty principle tells us that if we take Take our uncertainty in position, which we'll call delta x, and multiply it by the uncertainty in momentum, which we'll call delta p, then this product, when we multiply these two together, is greater than or equal to h bar divided by 2. Now, h bar is just a constant, it's just a number. So the right hand side of the inequality, h bar divided by 2, is also just a number. But let's think about this for a second. The uncertainty principle is telling us that when we multiply the two uncertainties together, this has to be greater than or equal to some number. In other words, the product has to be at least this number. What does this mean then? Well, it means that we cannot take the two quantities, delta x and delta p, and make them both as small as we would want them to be. If we make one of them small, let's say we make delta x very small, then the other quantity, delta p, has to get larger, so that when we multiply them together, it has to be at least h bar divided by 2. Why is this relevant to us then? Well, remember that these uncertainties represent uncertainties in our measurement of the position and the momentum of a particle, for example. Basically, here's a good way of thinking about it. Let's say normally in the classical world, we would measure the particle to be here. In the quantum world, it's not quite so simple. Before we measure the particle's position, we have a probability distribution, usually peaks at the position that we would measure classically. In other words, there's a very high probability that the particle is where we would measure it to be classically. However, it also has a probability of being somewhere else. And it's the width of this probability distribution, roughly speaking, that defines the uncertainty in our measurement of that particle's position. In other words, the uncertainty is how uncertain we are about a measurement. So coming back to our original point then, we cannot make both of these quantities, delta x and delta p, the uncertainties in position and momentum, we cannot make them arbitrarily small. We can make one of them arbitrarily small. We can even make one of them zero. In other words, we know exactly where the particle's, let's say, position is. But that's at the expense of the other. If the uncertainty in the particle's position is zero, then the uncertainty in the particle's momentum has to be infinity. In other words, if we know exactly where that particle is with 100% certainty, then we know absolutely nothing about that particle's momentum or speed. Now, there's actually a lot I haven't mentioned about the uncertainty principle. I'm skimming over a lot and simplifying a lot of things and taking away the subtlety out of a lot of things as well. I want us to look in some detail at where the uncertainty principle actually comes from. But before we go into that, let's look at a common description of the uncertainty principle that gets thrown around whenever the uncertainty principle is discussed. Okay, so let's consider we've got a particle. It's just doing its thing, sort of moving around in space being a particle. How would we measure the position and speed of that particle? We can't just stick a ruler down beside it, it's teeny tiny, it's a particle. So what we have to do is to fire light at that particle. The light then bounces off that particle and gives us information about that particle's position and speed or momentum. Now the interesting thing is at this scale, at the teeny tiny scale, quantum effects start to occur. The light that we fire at it has quantum properties now at this scale. It has wave particle duality. Now if you haven't heard of wave particle duality, pause this video and google it, YouTube it, Wikipedia it. It's a really interesting and weird concept. There are a lot of good videos and explanations about it online, so go check it out and then come back to this video. But anyway, so 
wave particle duality is a thing at those scales. In other words, when we fire light at this object, at this particle, the light itself will have both particle-like and wave-like properties. In other words, we'll be firing photons of light. Now, photons are particles, so we're firing particles of light at the particle that we're trying to measure. As well as this, because light has a wave-like behavior, we can define that light with a specific wavelength. Now, if the wavelength of the light that we're firing at the particle is short, if we have a short wavelength light, then we get more information about that particle's position, because the peaks in short wavelength light are closer together, same thing with the troughs, so we get more information about the whereabouts of that particle. However, this comes at a price. Remember that short wavelength particles are high energy particles. We can see this from the relationship E is equal to HC divided by lambda. E is the amount of energy carried by the light. H and C are both just constants, just numbers, we don't need to worry about them too much, and lambda is the wavelength of the light. So in other words, E is inversely proportional to lambda. So if we have short wavelength light going into our particle, then the energy of that short wavelength light is large and vice versa. Long wavelength, small energy. So as we said earlier, we're putting in short wavelength light into our particle. We get lots of information out by the particle's position. However, the light that we're putting in, short wavelength light, is high in energy. So it's gonna result in a kick to the particle. The act of measuring it with that photon has resulted in a kick and so we know less about that particle's speed or momentum. Now this is the explanation that gets thrown around when Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is discussed. However, this is not Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. This is an explanation provided by Heisenberg as to why the uncertainty principle may be occurring. It's not an actual description of the uncertainty principle itself. As well as this, it gets into a huge mess about how us measuring is making a difference to the particle's position or momentum and blah, 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 blah. Let's not get into that. And it also raises the question, well, why are we using light at all? Can't we think of a better way to measure the particle's position and momentum that would entirely subvert this problem. Well, that's the problem with this explanation. It's not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's just a possible explanation as to why it occurs. Instead, let's look at one of the ways of understanding where the principle actually comes from. Now, the way that I'm going to discuss of looking at the uncertainty principle will involve learning a little bit of maths. Specifically, we'll be looking at a topic known as Fourier transforms. However, don't worry. I'll explain the basics of Fourier transforms using just pictures and English. We won't need to know any complicated maths or even go into any complicated maths. So, Fourier transforms are based on a fairly simple concept. The idea is that lots of different functions, mathematical functions, can be broken down into building block functions. Confused? Let me give you an analogy to help. To find a good analogy, we need to look at another area of mathematics, specifically vectors. Now, for those of you that have studied vectors in any level of detail, you'll know that vectors have size and direction. So this arrow is a representation of a vector. It starts at a certain point and it finishes at a certain point. It has a certain size, how long the vector is, and it has a certain direction, the direction in which the arrow is pointing. Now, many of you will know that we can take this vector and break it down into components. We can choose to break it up, for example, into its horizontal component and its vertical component. So let's say that our original vector was a size of five units long. Now, how long one unit is doesn't matter. It could be a millimeter, it could be a centimeter, it could be a kilometer, it could even be a yard for my American friends out there. It doesn't matter. But let's say our vector that we're looking at is five units long. Now we can choose to break it up into its horizontal and vertical components, like I said. In this case, the horizontal component is three units long and the vertical component is four units long. Now the horizontal and vertical components are at 90 degrees to each other. The technical word for this is they're orthogonal to each other, which means that the triangle that we've just drawn is a right angle triangle. And hence we can apply Pythagoras' theorem to ensure that the lengths of the sides of the horizontal component, the vertical component, and the original vector do actually work out. Try it for yourself. Apply Pythagoras' theorem to the side lengths of this triangle. Anyway, so basically what we've done is we've taken this vector, the original vector that's five units long, and broken it down into a horizontal component which is three units long, and a vertical component which is four units long. So basically we've taken our vector and broken it down into sensible building blocks. The sensible building blocks being a unit long vector in the horizontal direction and a unit long vector in the vertical direction. We've got three in the horizontal and four in the vertical. Just like that, we can break a function up into sensible building blocks made up of different functions. Specifically, the functions that we'll be using as building blocks will be sine waves of different different frequencies. They're also unit sine waves, by the way, because their amplitudes are one. And basically what we can do is to take our function and break it down into different amounts of sine waves at different frequencies. Just like how we took our vector and broke it down into different amounts of horizontal vector and vertical vector. In this analogy, our original vector is our original function. The sine wave at one frequency is one of our sensible unit vectors. The sine wave at another frequency is another one of our sensible unit vectors, and so on and so forth. If we want five units of this sine wave, we just multiply it 
amplitude by phi. Then we add it to another sine wave with a different frequency. That's the analogy. By the way, interestingly, the sine waves of different frequencies are defined as being orthogonal to each other, just like how we had the horizontal unit vectors and the vertical unit vectors being orthogonal to each other. However, the definition of orthogonal in this case is different. They're not at 90 degrees to each other, but there's a really clever definition, which I won't go into. Just take my word for it, that they're orthogonal. Also, if you don't know exactly what I mean by sine waves at different frequencies, pause this video and check out on the internet an explanation for the frequencies of waves. However, let's carry on. So we've taken our original function and we've broken it down into building block functions. Now this is a really tricky concept, so feel free to replay this part of the video until you understand exactly what I'm talking about. If it's still not clear, please, please, please feel free to drop me a comment below and I'll try and clarify as much as I can in the comments. Otherwise, feel free to check out Fourier transforms on the internet, though I should warn you, they're quite complicated. Anyway, so the thing that's of interest to us when we break down a function into its constituent sine waves is that the sine waves that we break them down into are at different frequencies. The reason for this is that we can do something really clever. Let's say we have a function which we can break down into two units of one frequency and one unit of another frequency and nothing else. What we can do is to make a new plot a new function. On the x or the horizontal axis will be the frequencies of the components that we've broken our function into. And on the vertical axis will be how much of each component we have. So like we said, in our function, we had two units of the first frequency. So we'll plot at the first frequency along the horizontal axis, two units up, and we had one unit of the second frequency. Now we have no other frequency sine waves in our original function. So for every other frequency on our new plot, the amount will be zero. Now at this point, what we've done is we've made a new plot. We've made a new function. This new function, is known as a Fourier transform of our original function. We'll link it to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in a second. But before we do that, there's an interesting thing to note about Fourier transforms. If our original function is really, really wide on its horizontal axis, then the Fourier transform of that function is going to be really, really narrow. This is a property of Fourier transforms. For example, let's just take a normal sine wave. It's a pure sine wave, so it only has one frequency. So when we break it down into its constituent components, well, its constituent component is just itself. We've got one frequency, see one sine wave, one pure sine wave. Now a sine wave stretches on forever in the horizontal direction because it's a pure sine wave. It goes on forever in this direction and in this direction. Now, if we were to plot its Fourier transform, it looks something like this because its components, its building blocks are just made up of one frequency sine wave, the frequency of the original sine wave in this case, and it has no other sine wave frequency components. So, our original function, a sine wave, infinitely wide, has a Fourier transform that's infinitely narrow. It's peaked at one frequency, and it has a value of zero at every other frequency. So it's infinitely narrow. So a wide original function results in a narrow Fourier transform. And this is true the other way around as well, by the way. If you have a narrow original function, you get a wide Fourier transform. Okay, so let's bring this back and link it to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. To do this, we first need to remember what we said earlier about a particle's position and momentum being described by a probability distribution. In other words, we have a certain probability of a particle's position being in a range of values, and the same is true for its momentum. Now these probability distributions are known as wave functions. So the wave function for a particle's position basically tells us the probability with which we'll find the particle in a certain position, and the same is true for the momentum. Now here's the clincher. The wave function for a particle's momentum is the Fourier transform of the wave function for the particle's position. In other words, if the wave function for a particle's position is wide, so we have less information about it because it could be in a large range of values, Values, then the wave function of the particle's momentum is very narrow. In other words, we know a lot more about it. We're a lot more certain about the momentum because it could be in a very small range of values. And again, the opposite applies as well. Narrow position wave function, wide momentum wave function. The more we know about a particle's position, narrow wave function could be in a small range of values, the less we automatically know about its momentum. And this is how we can understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It is a fundamental property of the universe. It has got nothing to do with our measurement apparatus, our current technology, or our intelligence levels. It's just a property of the universe. And according to quantum mechanics, there's no way of getting around that. And with all of that being said, I hope that explanation was clear, but I'm going to stop the video here because it's getting really, really long. If there's something you don't understand that I haven't made very clear, please feel free to leave a comment down below. If I've also made an error, point it out. Let me know in the comments below and I'll try and fix it in the description or in the comments or something like that. And with all that being said, if this video has helped you understand the Heisenberg uncertainty principle a little bit better, then please leave a thumbs up. Also share this video with anyone you think might find it interesting or useful. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. If you're interested in more content like this, I make lots of fun physics videos and I'm hoping to do a lot more very, very soon. Leave me a comment down below telling me what area of physics you want me to cover next, as well as any problem areas of physics that you might be struggling with. Let me know down below. Anyway, Thanks so much for watching. I'm going to end the video here. Bye-bye-bye-bye.